Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton right here with you on Veteran Voices. Welcome to today's show. Uh, got a great conversation to you that we have a fellow veteran of the United States Air Force that is moving mountains to help our fellow veterans uh, in veteran communities. So stay tuned for what promises to be an uplifting and inspiring and intriguing conversation. Hey, quick programming note before we get started. This program is part of our Supply Chain Now family programming, really our, our Give Forward programming. You can find Veteran Voices wherever you get your podcasts from, and be sure to check out our partners over at vets to industry uh, which are doing some great things. They're a great nonprofit helping veterans and, and trend, uh, veterans in transition, folks in need, connect the dots with all the great resources, including the one you're going to hear about today. So you can learn more at vets2industry.com. Okay, so with no further ado, I want to welcome in our featured guest. Our guest served as a security specialist in the U.S. Air Force from 1991 to 95. After earning four degrees, raising a family, she was inspired to start a very unique grassroots-driven veterans organization, one that raises awareness, which is really important, and financial support for veterans in crisis and in need. She is certainly a hero in my book. So please join me in welcoming Gretchen Smith, founder of Code of Vets. Gretchen, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting Code of Vets on. Um, I'm so excited about sharing our mission today. Hey, we are too. You know, we've been tracking you. Uh, from afar, I love the as we were talking in, in the pre-show. I love just the practicality. Of course, your purpose and passion is is awesome, but just the meet a need and we're going to tackle it. That is a beautiful thing. So I look forward to learning more uh, about Code of Vets. But before we get to that, um, we really want to dive into your journey. You know, you, you've been so focused and your mission so focused on on, all, on everyone else. Let's learn more about Gretchen Smith. So for starters. Tell us where you grew up, and, and you got to give us the goods on your upbringing. To give us some anecdotes. You know, I, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina. I'm a mountain girl, uh, Tar Hill. Um, both of my parents are from Waynesville, North Car Carolina. That's where my dad is buried um, in Waynesville. Uh, just a very simple. I grew up in a poor environment. Uh, I didn't have a lot of opportunities within, you know, in the mountains. And uh, so I, as I was growing up, my dad was very patriotic. Uh, all of the men in my family had served in the military. So it was for me, it just made sense to join the military. It gave me a chance to, to get out of the mountains and, and to experience life. And boy, did it ever. <laughs> <laughs> because basic training was different for, for me, uh, you know, with my Southern accent, I just was, you know, really immersed into the world of diversity because the military is truly a microcosm of our nation. It's, it's, a, it's, it's great with diversity. So for me, that was my first uh, journey into the world of a diverse world. And I loved every moment of it. I soaked, I was like a sponge. I soaked it up. So that was really, you know, just a great way for me to grow up um, and become an adult in the military. It gave me stability. It gave me a future, um, just provided me with the tools that I needed. I met my husband over in Germany. Uh, it was, you know, and we just knew, we clicked right away. Um, he's a Buckeye from the state of Ohio. We met, we fell in love, got married over there. Um, we actually, you know, started our family over in Germany, got pregnant. Awesome. And it just, it just was a, it's a, we have a beautiful history together. We've created this great life. I'm so proud of my family. Uh, and I did earn four degrees uh, as a direct thanks to the Air Force. And the, the Air Force gave me this drive, this purpose of wanting to better myself, to be all I can be and just to aim high. So that's what I did. So, all right. So I'm going to back up and, and I want to, I want to kind of unpack this a smidge. So first off, when you, when you, when you hear, when I hear about someone growing up in North Carolina, I'm from South Carolina and, and, you know, food is runs in our blood. Right. And of course, barbecue in, in those two States and across, across the country is important. Did you grow up is uh, was it Waynesville? Waynesville. Waynesville. Was it, is that, uh, is that the East side or the West side of North Carolina? Yeah. The West of North Carolina mountains. It's in Haywood County, which butts up against the Tennessee line. Okay. So when it comes to barbecue, then that uh, the West side of, of North Carolina is, 
Is that uh, no sauce and all about the smoke and the meat? Well, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I always get that confused. <laughs> In South Carolina, you have four, re you have, you have like, it seems like 12 different uh, traditions. Uh, I was raised on, on mustard-based sauce, right? Mustard-based pork barbecue, uh, it being from Aiken. So uh, Waynesville, so that's Western style uh, barbecue. Any, anything else uh, when you were growing up there, anything else that you look back on? I mean, clearly it sounds like you had a challenging upbringing given that the set of circumstances, but what else was really special? What else when you look back and think about before you joined the military, what really stands out as, as maybe like a family tradition? You know what? It was a really simple life. We And one thing that really stands out to me is that I grew up and we ate from a garden. That was just a day-to-day, -day, you know, part of our life. We'd go out and pick or, you know, grab the potatoes or whatever we want to eat that night. For me, that's, those are great memories, you know, and it's a very healthy way to grow up. And yes. we were always out in the woods. I was always out there with my brothers and friends, you know, building tree houses and swinging on <laughs> grapevines. So there's a lot to say for that lifestyle, you know, Agreed. it might've been, you know, sheltered and a little bit, I want to say ignorant to the world, because when you grow up in the mountains, you're very isolated, but it, it, it was a very simple way to grow up. And so I have, you know, it was challenging, but I also have some beautiful memories and it has, and I think I'm the person I am today because of the way I grew up and when growing up poor, I'm very um, humble. I appreciate everything that we have worked for. Um, so some great traits come along with that. Great. Excellent points. Excellent points. Um, okay. So now uh, when it comes to joining the military, um, did, you, did you view joining the Air Force as a, a way to kind of see the world or was it about getting a job or what appealed to you? You know what? It was all of the above. I wanted a way out of the, the mountains. I wanted to experience life and the world. I wanted to know what it was all about. You know, I was 18 years old. And so I joined the Air Force and it just, the Air, Air Force appealed to me. Um, the Army and Marines looked like it was going to be a little bit tough. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I chose the Air Force and boy, did I choose right. Um, I have to tell you, when I first walked into the dining room, because I did grow up for I thought I was a millionaire. I just walked in the dining room and I was in awe of the of the desserts. You know, they they had them beautifully displayed in this glass encasement. And I just was so impressed with my decision. I just walked around with such pride in my uniform. You know, it, the, the, the little things mattered to me. Mm. Some, you know, some people may not take notice of that, but for me, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, I, I really did something with my life here. So I was able to start taking college classes while I was in the service. Um, my supervisor was very much on board with, with pro education and gave me the green light to do that. And uh, he really inspired me. We actually took a couple of classes together. And so I really have some fond memories of Sergeant Carr. Um, just, just being a motivator, a mentor. And I just, I, I wanted to be like him. You know, he just had it all together. Great guy. Um, and for me, that's what got me hooked on education. And that's how I ended up with four degrees was based on him and his journey. And just him being there for me um, as I was growing up. Love it. So Sergeant Carr was clearly one person that stood out and had a big impact on, on both your time in the uniform, probably also just your overall journey. Anyone else? Be, um, obviously, Joe uh, was a, a great person you met while in uniform. Who else sticks out? Someone that really impacted your, your time in service? You know what? She was only in my life briefly, but I have to mention Sergeant Ham. She was in, she was one of my uh, drill instructors, my uh, tech instructors, and I, she was hardcore. She was a fierce personality, and I really did, I, I, you know, I struggled a little bit in basic training with the physical physical component, but with the mental, you know, where they, you know, they're in your face yelling. It's, it's, it's It was very difficult. So, it I, I struggled a little bit. She noticed that. And one day she brought me into her office and she sat me down and she shut the door and I got a little bit teary because I didn't know what was going on, but she really gave me a motivational speech. And she said, Gretchen, I see a lot of myself in you when I was your age. I just want you to know you're going to be okay. You're going to make it and it's going to be worth it. You keep pushing it. You keep, you know, giving, giving it your best. You're going to, you're going to survive this. So she, she gave me that speech and it just gave me a sense of pride that she, you know, chose me to bring me in, to give me that speech and to say, Hey, you're going to be all right. You're going to, you know, I needed that. Right. So I will always remember her. And it was just a, you know, that brief six weeks that I was with her, but boy, did she set the tone um, for the rest of my four years of service because mm -hmm. she really did instill of, you know what, well, I, I can do this. She just gave me that encouragement that I needed. 
You know, that is such a, a beautiful message, Gretchen, because, you know, as we talk a lot with folks that we interview or, or sidebar conversations, you know, especially during the pandemic, you never know that two minute conversation that you have with someone that, that they're going through a hard time. You never know the impact you can have just with words, just with an uplifting message. Even if you never see them again, you know, two, two folks passing through an airport, you never know the impact you'll have. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, okay. So I want to move, we got so much tackling. I want to take a deeper dive in code of vets. So, uh, Beyond the people, uh, and, and you met Joe in Germany, and y'all have been married now 27 years, you were telling me pre, pre-show, right? Yep, that's right. Holy cow. Now, was he also active duty Air Force? Yes. Yeah, he served five years. He was in transportation logistics. He's a, he's a supply chain guy now. He ended up with four degrees as well. Uh, I motivated him in that area. <laughs> But yeah, we, you know, we've built a beautiful life and we do look back and we, um, we can attribute that to our time in service and um, just gave us the tools that we needed. As I said before, um, just, we, we, we've created our version of the American dream. Love that. Okay. So folks, if you're listening and, and, um, you know, the supply, you know, we're a little bit partial to supply chain around here, uh, the end and global supply chain industry. If you're listening, it offers wonderful opportunities for uh, service members. So if you haven't checked it out and you're still doing your homework about where you want to work and, and what sectors and whatnot, make sure you check out the supply chain uh, industry. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about, before we talk about your transition, one of my favorite questions to ask, because we have so many you know, key takeaways and those, those eureka moments, right, where something dawns on you that maybe you hadn't thought about, and, and then you kind of, kind of sticks with you. What was a key eureka moment in, during your 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 time in uniform? You know, I I, I had several of them. I grew up so sheltered, just you know, interacting with all the different personalities and um, individuals from different regions of the country. It made me, you know, I just started embracing people. I love being around um, everybody, anybody, and everybody. I just I, I love hearing everybody's journeys, their stories, their accents. Uh, for me, it was different. I had, you know, so just the world of diversity has really always been a draw for me. And I think that you can see that in, in kind of that's in how, you know, and how we work and who we help. It's just, we help everybody across the board. Um, I love them all. You know, they're all my brothers and sisters in arms. So I feel like I really brought that um, sense that, that love of community from the military over into the civilian world. And now I'm giving it back, you know, through, um, back to the veteran community through kind of that. So I, I just, I love being around people of, of anybody through, through living in our country, growing up in different ways. I, you know, I made such good friends with so many different people in the Air Force. And we do come from all walks of life, Scott, you know that. And it's just a really good mash. And I just love how they, they, they tear us down as individuals and build us up as a team and we work as one. And I love that. It made me feel like I was part of something. And so that, is, you know, all of that is a eureka moment of, you know, I want to take this and I want, this is how I want to live my life is I want to embrace everyone that comes in my life um, and just, and be the person, you know, do that to say, Hey, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I make your life better? Um, you know, cause you know, I know what it's like to grow up in a rough situation um, in, in difficult circumstances. And it's, it's really caused me to, you know, to say, Hey, I, I'm going to give back. I, I want to be a part of your journey and let, let's see what we can do. And give back. You certainly have, uh, which we're going to touch on in a second, but you know, that is a, I appreciate you sharing that because while certainly like any other organization, the military has its challenges, right? We, we've seen some of the things that the army's going through and, and, and other services. However, there's so many things the military gets right. And one of them is its approach to embracing diversity. You know, I, just like you, I look back on uh, the brothers and sisters I serve with and where they were from, you know, across the country, and really, from, for that matter, across the world. Uh, many folks were, were earning their citizenship while serving in, in the U.S. Air Force during my time, and I think it's still a popular program these days. It, it's really, it's a wonderful thing, so I appreciate you uh, sharing uh, the impact it had on kind of your worldview and, and how you approach serving, and it clearly, uh, uh, you are serving all. We've all seen the uh, the campaigns you've running, and, and uh, I don't think you've met with someone yet that you hadn't been ready to jump in uh, into their life and, and help them out. So let's talk about, you know, it's a transition with here at Veteran Voices. You know, if we've heard challenging circumstances around anything, top of the list is transitions. You know, I, um, I had it, I, frankly, I had it made, you know, I had a, I had a four-year degree, I didn't have four degrees, but I had a four-year degree 
I did. I was, was not a combat veteran, so I didn't have you know challenging things like PTSD. I was I, I was going back home. I had a family and, and support network there. I could not find a job. I didn't know how to find a job, and and it took me a long time, especially to find find that groove right. Um, so let's let's talk about your transition. Let's, let's describe that if you would, and then I'd love to kind of have you give some advice to folks that may be navigating their own transition right now. Well, I, I had a tough time with transitioning as a female veteran because um, I had gotten pregnant um, at the end of my tour of duty, and I did I did not know at the time. So we'd signed all of our paperwork, and we had waived any type of carryover for insurance because I didn't know. So once we did get out, Joe and I were this young couple, 22, 23 years old. You know, he his plan was to go to college. Mine was to work because I was able to attain, a, a, you know, my bachelor's degree while I was serving. And so I was going to get this great big paying job <laughs> and, you know, take care of us while he went to school. Well, little did we know life happens, you know, and we got this baby on the way and no, insur no insurance company would cover us. So we had been able to save this little nest egg. We were so proud of it. Uh, and we actually had gone through uh, the winter without heat because we wanted to minimize our bills and, you wow. know, as much as we, yeah, we were hardcore. So we got out, you know, all of our nest egg went to our baby, went to um, the, our maternity doctor and to childbirth uh, because we, we couldn't get that coverage until after I'd given birth. And finding a job pregnant is not easy either. So I was trying to conceal the pregnancy. Uh, we were trying to pay for the pregnancy on our own, and it was a struggle. Um, we had a few months where we ate peanut butter and hot dogs, <laughs> you know? but it really bonded us together. You know, it could have torn us apart, but it did the opposite. We came together as a team, and we're like, we're going to get through this. You know, we've got our service history behind us. We can get through anything together. So Joe and I became very tight during those times, and he did go to college earned his degree, I was able to get a, a, a job as a probation officer making $15,000 a year because wow. this was back in 1995, but that was very difficult to live on as, as a young family of three. Uh, and uh, once I did have the baby, I had just gotten a job at eight and a half months pregnant. So I'd only, I worked two or three work weeks and then I had my daughter. And so during that time off with her, I was not paying. So we really struggled starting out in life. And that's a tough transition. Um, we can laugh about it now, but going through those moments, we, you know, we, there were some tears and there was some worry and concern of, are we, you know, can we do this? But we did it. We, we mm. figured out a way, you know, we made it work. And uh, fast forward 27 years, here we are, we got this incredible life. So the, the, the world of transition is, it's hard. It is hard. Um, because life can throw you some curveballs, just like the pregnancy. It wasn't planned. We were, you know, prepared, you know, we weren't ready for that, but we, we made it work, you know, yeah. uh, we just, but we had such a good solid foundation with each other and a transition can be very tough on veterans when they, when they have, are coming back to dysfunctional homes or family environments, or if they are completely on their own. And that's what I've run into as the founder of Cade of Vets is there's a lot of challenges when we get out of the military. So let's uh, we want to talk more a lot more about that because as we were talking pre-show while the awareness and while i think what i would say corporate support and understanding we, we've, we've moved the needle a little bit over the last five ten years from what i've seen we still got a long way to go um so let's talk about uh let's talk about code events so first off uh before we talk about uh why your why tell us what it is first what so what is code events Code of Vets is a very unique organization because we actually function on social media. We are a strictly social media 501c3 veteran organization, and primarily we are on Twitter. Um, and I, don't, I, I have never seen another org out there who operates the way we do. I believe we're cutting edge. Uh, we operate on 2% budget because of the way we function. We're very grassroots. Um, I have a partner, Dr. Cindy Walter, who has her PhD in public health. She is a phenomenal professional veteran advocate and has been advocating for veterans for many years, way before Code of Vets. And she, broke, she brought a skill set to the table that I did not have and that I needed. And that was being able to vet veterans, you know, in this, this social media atmosphere was, was very difficult. But she, the way her system was set up, she was already set up to do it. So it was just a match made in heaven. God really did. We crossed paths for a reason. Uh, we make a fierce team. We're able to assist the veterans across the nation in every state every day by using the Twitter platform. 
they we do direct them to the, the Code of Vets website and they fill out the vet need form. She vets the veterans and looks at their needs, um, vets the needs as well. We triage our cases. And then once she has approved them and starts working on with working with them, especially our, our, our homeless vets who are at risk for homelessness, then she will send them to me to raise funds. I'm the fundraiser. I share a little bit of their journey, their picture, make this, I make the heart connection with the donor. And it really is, it, it's, it's simple. We set it up in a simple way, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes. But we are, we're doers. We don't talk about it. We're not, we do raise awareness by our actions, but we are not out there just to talk about veterans' issues and needs. We're actually in the weeds with the veterans every day. <laughs> I love it. Deeds, not words. That's what makes things happen. That's what, that's what helps people. That's what gets homeless veterans off the street into, into their home. You know, um, without naming names, we have, we've had folks on this podcast right here, uh, a family of five, if, as I recall, I believe. Uh, that went a couple months during the pandemic without a place to live. And and they credit getting themselves back into a home through the work y'all do at the Code of Vets. So that is, you know, uh, hammer and nail and uh, hammer meets nail sometimes can be a beautiful thing. And I love the, you know, I mean, this is a compliment. I love the simplicity of how you operate, you and your team and your partner um, and really how, I mean, gosh, how streamlined it is and how the funds that y'all are able to raise, man, you're moving mountains and, and, and the bulk of those 98% it sounds like are going to help those in need. So let's, um, so now I want to talk about your inspiration. You know what, Let, let's go back. Um, first off, when did you found it and, and what was the inspiration behind it? Well, I found it back in 2017, October of 2017 to be exact. My kids are grown. I've got all this time on my hands and I wanted to do something to honor my dad. Uh, I lost my dad in this battle with PTSD. He served two tours of duty in the jungle in Vietnam. He was airborne infantry, um, you know, just did a lot of things in the jungle, witnessed a lot of trauma, and he never really did get the help that he needed, Scott. And he, he did reach out to the Asheville, North Carolina VA when he had initially gotten back because his behavior was so out of control. He was having night tremors or a night, uh, he was having nightmares. Uh, he, he was uh, self-medicating with drugs and alcohol, just, he was a mess. Um, his behavior on the outside was very chaotic. And I think it was a direct reflection of how he felt on the inside. He was broken. Mm. Um, and he, and he was carrying all of this that he needed to talk about. Well, when he reached out for help, um, the doctor basically told him it was something called shell shock and that he needed to suck it up and be a man and to shove it way down deep and never speak of it again. Wow. We have, we've made great strides since that era. They, I don't believe they tell our vets that anymore, but back then they did. Uh, and it just destroyed my dad. It ate away at my dad like a cancer. Um, his life was always up and down. There was, there was some periods of stability. I have some good memories with dad, but the, he, we ended up losing him. Um, we, we just could not get him to go get the help to sit down. And I truly believe if a brother in arms would have sat down with him and said, Danny, like, let's talk about what's going on. Let's, let's try to figure out how to get you the help you need. Mm -hmm. That that's, there, there's just that camaraderie brotherhood is powerful and it's real. And I believe in it because I've witnessed it through Code of Vets. And I truly believe that, you know, a brother in arms could have helped my dad, whereas a civilian just didn't understand. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to do something to honor my dad because he was a good man. He had a good heart and just, he was very troubled and he had a shattered spirit. And so we, through Code of Vets, we've actually saved several lives. We've given veterans second chances at life. Um, and it's just been a beautiful way to honor dad and to create a legacy for him. Gosh, uh, uh you shared a, a ton there and, 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 you know, an hour never does any of, any of, of, uh, powerful conversation justice, but uh, just as, as a as a very important aside, your father's name was Danny E. Smiley, um, and and certainly rest in peace, sir. The legacy uh, of what he's created in you and your passion, your purpose, and all the great things you've done. I mean, uh, what a what an incredible living legacy. So I appreciate you sharing. Um, so what about? I, I want to touch on one thing. If, you know, like you, we're both careful to generalize. However, you referenced a period in time, you know, if, if any civilians are listening and folks that may have never served but are big veteran supporters and advocates, you know, one of the reasons that veterans don't go get, even today, 
go out and get the help they're looking for because is because during a lot of different units and uh, branches and, and, and organizations within the military, you know, they get the advice that you just, that your, that your father, uh, your late father received, suck it up, you know, put your boots on, go out and do it. You're fine. And that, you know, you don't, oftentimes veterans don't want to be, don't want a signal that there's something wrong and we, that we've got to change that. And you're probably you and your partner probably see that firsthand. Is that right, Gretchen? Yeah, we do. We do. Our veterans don't want to talk about it. They don't want to reach out. They don't want to appear weak because they they are our warriors. Our combat vets are, you know, the front lines to a, a defense for our nation. Um, and they want to have, they want to be strong. Uh, and there, there's, a, you know, pride is involved as well. You know, it's a pride thing. But also there's the other components. It's very complex with PTSD, with suicidal um, issue in our community. Um, security clearances are at risk. You know, that a lot of our, our veterans come out with security clearances and use those um, to, to gain employment after the military. And they do not want to say, I need help, I'm struggling with my PTSD, or, you know, I feel like I may have a TBI issue. They don't want to lose that clearance because it's, how, it's who they are. It's, it's how they make their living. And also Second Amendment rights are at stake. Mm. I've actually, you know, seen a, a veteran have their rights removed because he reached out for help. Wow. And he was in the VA psych ward getting the help he needed, but at that time they took his gun rights, and that's it's not right. We need to talk about this, these things and shine a light on, you know, when our veterans do come forward because it's tough for them to come forward in the first place. We don't we don't need to punish them for it. Mm. We don't need to remove things from them because they say, you know, I need help. I can't do this by myself anymore. So it's important that we do highlight that, Scott, and talk about it. Mm. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about the, those last two, uh, you know, you learn something new every day, whether you're, you, you've been, a, you've worn the uniform or your hat. And I've never really thought about, especially the security clearance piece, because there is a, you know, there's a healthy, vibrant government service uh, and, and related um, uh, uh, industry for folks as a, as a transition out of the military that you're right. They do use those clearances. I never even thought about that and how that could be at stake if they say, Hey, I need to talk with somebody. So that's an excellent point. And, and it is a, it is a very complex issue as is the, um, you know, the suicide rates we're seeing, there's so many different factors, but if we can just work together to get the awareness out there, you know, that that's, um, that's doing a lot of good. So I I appreciate sharing. And I've got, you know, speaking of which, um, I've got a ton of, of, of really powerful information and facts and and uh, stats on your website codeofvets.com i mean uh, approximately 40,000 homeless veterans on any given night some and I, I believe that is a department us department of housing and urban development stat if i'm not mistaken and that's probably conservative uh, because of the it lack is, of I believe it's upwards of 60,000 now due to the pandemic wow yeah. um in the past year alone the number of diagnosed ptsd cases in the military jumped 50 percent and that's only reported and diagnosed cases and that's just that's just a couple of the, the, of the uh, reasons for for why we've got to double down our support of our veteran community there's a lot more y- y'all can check it out at codeofvets.com um all right so we're going to talk about there's good news if you look for it they're really even these most challenging times there's good news and i want to uh talk about some of your wins uh, i've seen them you know I, you're a great uh, Code of Vets is a great Twitter follow, uh, and I love to see. I love to see all the work being done. Number one, but I love to see you know when when, when the need is met. That's something we should all celebrate. So you know, uh, of all the wins that that Code of Vets has has enjoyed, what's been a couple of your favorite ones? Well, we had a, a veteran reach out um, to to my partner, and he was in a very difficult situation. He was in a um, he was in a VA, not in a VA. It was a VA, there there was money being sent to, to this homeless halfway shelter out in California. And they actually were neglecting him. They were not feeding him enough. Um, and, you know, he, he had emailed this long, you know, this all this information to my partner. And it, and it was truly was an emergent situation. So we actually extracted him from this facility and moved him to a place where we knew he would be safe and be fed. And this, it, we, we have been with this guy for well over two, uh, probably pushing three years. He's a great success story. Um, got the help that he needed, uh, fa- found a job, was in this um, uh, halfway house, so, so to speak, and really got back on his feet. 
bought his car. He had lost his license. Had, you know, hadn't had him in a few years. But it, he was regaining his sense of independence. And he had served. He was a combat vet. So he had lost, you know, that along the way. Just, you know, that brotherhood, that camaraderie, or, you know, what's my purpose in life? And slowly he re rebuilt that and he rebuilt his, you know, just his pride and his sense of self. And, you know, he got, he got a job, he got his driver's license, he got a car, he got his own place. Now he's, you know, traveling across the country, you know, living life. That's, That's a right. huge success story for Cody Vets to come, you know, from a homeless shelter, a place that was not giving him ad adequate food. Um, and there were some other issues that we addressed. And then to, you know, to be moved to another place and to, to have people surround you that care about you. My partner just embraced him and wrapped around him for two years and helped to guide him. We had a lady there that was boots on the ground with us and she gave him some guidance. And I'm telling you what, when you have solid people in your life that you know, that give a damn about you, that care, uh, beautiful things can happen, Scott. Um, and we just got so many of these stories across the country. We had a, a single dad with five children living in a minivan in Georgia. And we, we took that family and, um, you know, we got them out of that minivan. I was able to raise funds for them in one day and help secure them an apartment. They thought they had won a million dollars. You know, to, and not only did we get their apartment, but we filled the apartment with beds, with household goods, with furniture, with a TV. Um, we, we got them the clothes that they needed. The dad ended up getting a job and becoming self-sufficient. He had just gotten himself into a situation, you know, where he was the sole caretaker for these five kids. And it was, you know, he had a couple of younger ones and it's tough to work. We don't, you know, what are you going to do about child care? So when you get in those, get in those type of predicaments and you don't have a family to support you, who do you have? So he did. He reached out and you know, found, found out about Code of Vets. We were able to get him back on track. That's a huge success story. That's a, that's a whole family we're talking about. Right. It's you know, That's a domino effect. That's going to impact those children for the rest of their lives. They're going to remember us and, and they're going to know that we cared about them. Hmm. Um, and that's just two. That is just two of the numerous um, wins and, and, and plenty of the ongoing needs. Uh, it's heartbreaking. I mean, it really is, you know, there's a, there's an organization here in Atlanta called the veteran veterans empowerment organization. And, uh, you, you know, the first time I, I came on campus, I was, I was really understanding that they were taking homeless veterans that had no documentation. So they don't have that. They don't have their ID. They don't, they don't have anything to access the benefits. And, you know, that's just such a blind spot. You know I mean? They don't, they, they even, even the help they could apply for, they've got that huge barrier. So we've got to figure out a way to not to, to make it easier for our veterans to get resources so they're not living in the van with their children, you know, and, and that's where groups like yours come into play because, you know, um, it's, as we all know, it's tough to change government regulations and policies and legislation, all that stuff. But man, to do what y'all are doing, you just kind of bypass all of that and get to the need we with, do. There's with no the red resources. Tape. No yeah. red tape with us. It really, it's a heart mission. Uh, we just, we jump right in and we, we connect them with the local resources too, because sometimes it's tough to navigate, especially when you're in a situation um, of, you know, homelessness and there's kids involved and there's a lot of raw emotion involved and they're just, you know, usually they're on edge and and Cindy just really just, you know, says, let's take this one day at a time, one step at a time. And she guides them step by step to the resources. And then we are, you know, their biggest resource. We can get them into an apartment. We can fill it. Um, she will help them find a job. Uh, we've, we just, we, we helped take 52 veterans off the streets last year. And it's going to be even more than that this year. So wow. we're really taking, we're, we're, we're making a difference. We are. Huge. Hearts, hearts did you gone. say, did you say 52 veterans off the street like yes. in, in 2020? In 2020, yeah, we wow. had 2,000 veterans, and 52 of them were homeless. Wow. Okay. So um, you kind of already addressed some of the other uh, needs that folks should be aware of. But is there anything else? You know, um, we have a, a variety of listeners, many of which have served, right? But still, we talked pre-show about even current veterans are kind of oblivious. Uh, we all are, are oblivious to some degree, but you know. Everyone needs to be aware of, of, of these challenges you're seeing firsthand. What else would you add? Is there anything else you think our listeners got to know about the needs that our veteran community have? Yeah, 
Yeah, there, there's one particular need that we've come across and that we've embraced and made it part of our mission. And initially, I, you know, I, I hadn't even thought about it, but we, I kind of learned as, you know, as we grow and grow, and that's funeral expenses. Um, there, you know, a lot of our, our, some of our veterans are, you know, isolated, you know, or they either don't have family or they haven't, you know, talked to family in years and there's nobody there to claim the body at the morgue. So kind of that's, we have taken it on as part of our mission to claim our brothers and sisters in arms and raise funds for them. Or if the family is indigent, you know, there's no insurance policy. We take that on as well. So that's kind of a hidden need that's not talked about a lot. Uh, and it is a national issue. Um, we've assisted veterans throughout the country, deceased vets that have been laying in morgues for days and days and nobody's claimed them. And um, coroners are starting to find out about code vets. It's, you know, it spreads through word of mouth. You know, home directors are starting to find out about us and they will contact us and say, hey, you know, we've got an unclaimed vet. Do you, you know, do you want to assist, with, assist us with this? So that's really, you know, the donations come into play there is so it's so critical for us to raise as much as we can because you know we, we're taking on these challenges and we do we offer up to five thousand dollars per uh, funeral because we want we want to give them a dignified funeral we i love our community and i honor their service and so does my partner dr cindy walter we just want to do what's right for the veteran um and so we that that's an issue that i we we've taken on and there's also something else is when we have vet suicides um a lot of our, our widows do not have a lot of money a lot, they were living paycheck to paycheck and then all of a sudden they lose you know if the breadwinner was the veteran all of these expenses come along and there's an expense that i was not aware, aware about and that's professional cleaning after a veteran suicide so we have started um, taking care of that as well. There's there's just so much need in our community, Scott, and a lot of it is kind of brushed under the rug and not talked about because it's a hard topic to talk about, um, but we need to, you know, and we need to be there for those widows um, during those times and to let them know, hey, we, we've got you, you know, we're here for you um, and we're going to do what we can to, to ease, you know, to ease your pain during this time. So there's there's some different things that we're doing behind the scenes. We don't always put everything out, but those those are a couple of the things that we have taken on that's sacred uh, in our community. Mm. Uh, well said. Um, they are absolutely sacred, and and they're in the blind spot for so many, uh, including myself. I've never never thought about that, you know. Especially, and, and it's a shame given what's also a shame, which is the suicide rate. Um, we've got to get our 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 arms around that. Um, so how can let's let's move again? Let's uh, this is an opportunity for folks. Uh, this is an opportunity for business leaders, veterans, folks that you know look for ways, powerful ways to um, you know make the don the donations, the budget of donations maybe they have each year, um, and organizations. The, the, um, so tell us if you would tell us a little bit about how you partner with all of the above, and 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 how can folks jump right in and help. Well, uh, <laughs> we all need, you know, we all need funds, you know, so donations are a great way to support Code of Vets. Uh, we, we, we would love to have a business maybe sponsor our 2% operating costs. We did have a Texas couple who covered um, our costs for this year. So that's important to note that now for this year, the remainder of the year, 100% that comes in will be going directly to veterans. So that, that's a huge praise report for us. And that's, you know, it's just a load lifted from us. But anyway, we would love to have a business to come on board to do that. And, you know, we help veterans in a variety of ways. And that's the funeral expenses. We do utilities, disconnects, evictions, foreclosures, assistance, um, groceries, auto repos. Uh, you know, there are just so many different ways that we touch lives um, uh, in real time. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this in real time without the red tape. And that's what's unique about Code of Vets. So if you if you want to you know help in that way please do but social media is where we live it's where I I work seven days a week uh, you can find us on Twitter at Code of Vets and another crit critical way is to share our mission is to get on there create a Twitter page I promise you Code of Vets is worth it we're doing a lot of great things out there we we put that we put veterans out there daily um, we need for that to be shared we need it to be reposted because that's how we bring in our donors that's how we raise awareness of what's going on in our community and the more that it gets out the bigger you know we grow and the more veterans we can help so those are just two really uh, great ways to help kind of that be a part of our team 
uh, outstanding. Uh, and, and folks, you know, if you, you, I love, again, it's deeds, not words. You know, this is not an organization uh, that like some nonprofits out there where they've got a 40% overhead. I mean, this is the beautiful thing here is, and you give the code of vets that is going to find the overwhelming majority is going to find the company or the families in need, individuals in need uh, and, and in crisis, as we've seen some of the, some of the uh, projects y'all have uh, been supporting and, and uh, raising funds for. So what a great story, Gretchen, I'll tell you and your partner, Dr. What was her name again? Dr. Cindy Walter. Dr. Cindy Walter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you are doing just at such an incredible service. Um, we're going to help, you know, you give from what you have. Uh, and I, I, <laughs> I wish maybe one day, I wish I could write a big old check and, and help, but, but you know what, what we can do is help get the word out. And, and we want to do just that. You do have a very unique, I love the social, I love the grassroots and the social media, you know, um, element here. Cause it's, it's, it's so democratic. Anyone can help in. If you can't write a check or make a donation, Hey, like it, retweet it, share it you know, and, and get the word out that, that, that seems to help, uh, as well. So, um, how can folks, so code of vets.com, right. That's the URL. That's right. Uh, clearly are highly active, highly active on Twitter. Is there any other social platforms that, that you would point people to? Well, LinkedIn, I'm trying to grow that particular account right now. And then we are on Gab and on Facebook and Instagram. So yeah, just follow us out there on social media because it really is how we how we survive. And we operate on these platforms and it's a beautiful way to use these platforms to do something positive, to do something powerful and to be uplifting and to be a light in our nation right now. And I think it's a great way to do it. And I, and I have to say, I got a phone call from a veteran. I have to end it with this, Scott. Um, he, he, he had messaged me his phone number and said, would you please call me, Gretchen? So I gave him a call and he said, you don't know me. You don't know my name. You don't need to. He said, but I, I want you to know that uh, one of your tweets saved my life. And he said, I was sitting at my table. He said, I'm going through a really, really rough divorce. And he said, I had a gun in one hand and I had my phone in the other hand. And my phone vibrated. And I looked down and it was a tweet from Code of Vets. And it was a tweet about hope. And he said, so I put my gun down and I clicked on that tweet and I read what the veterans were saying underneath it. And he said, I chose different that day. And I just wanted you to know that. So there's... There is power in social media. We are reaching our veterans one at a time, and it matters. They matter. Their service matters. So I'm, I'm really encouraging people to go out and follow us and help us to grow this. We can reduce that number of 22 that we lose every day mm. um, just by being out there and letting them know that we care. Wow. Okay. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. It takes leadership. It takes action. And it takes um, people like Gretchen Smith and Dr. Cindy Walter and, and, all of the folks that jump in and, and help support what you are doing. So folks, we've been talking with Gretchen Smith, founder of Code of Vets. You can learn more and jump into the, uh, and help support their mission at codeofvets.com. Uh, Gretchen, thanks so much for your time. We'll have you back. You know, we, maybe we'll have to jump on to a live stream and help continue to get y'all's message out there. You're doing, you're doing uh, critical work for our community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Scott. You bet. Okay, folks. What a powerful, I told you, it was going to be a powerful, intriguing, but uplifting and inspirational conversation here today. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. Hey, find us across social. And if you're a veteran that has a story to tell, you want to get your voice out there, reach out. And we'll see if we can't get you into our uh, production schedule. Uh, but most importantly, you know, wishing you the best wherever you are, but you got to do good. Give forward. Be the change that's needed. Be just like Gretchen. And on that note, we'll see you next time right here at Veteran Voices. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at supplychainnow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.